Trust Fund was launched, very important initiative with eight different uh, partners, UN agencies, and so on. Several of us in the room, several of you in the room today are partners in this initiative. Um, the German Minister of Environment made a very clear statement, yeah? And I think we heard something similar from the French Secretary of State, which is that you know, pre prevention is, is, is far more effective than cure. It's far more cost effective. And yet there's these extraordinary statistics that those of us like me from the world of ecology who have now been stepping into this world of public health have come to learn. And, and personally, I should be very shocked by 3% of public health spending, 3% is spent on prevention. I, I was truly shocked to hear that. Um, why does prevention get so little attention in public health generally, Christina, let alone in the conversations about pandemic prevention, preparedness, and response? Thank you so much, Nigel. And I just want to take a moment to thank, uh, to thank you and Kim and uh, all of the organizers for having us here on the panel. It's really great to be here with you. Um, and I think that's a golden question. I think you should have ended with that question, right? <laughs> because, because it's true. Uh, prevention does get a lot less a, a lot less attention than preparedness and response. And I think a lot of it has to do with, with the culture um, of the way, for instance, uh, medical communities are trained, right? There is, I mean, they're trained to, and re to respond to disease, to cure disease, and not necessarily to prevent it. So it isn't necessarily a more holistic vision of health that you would find across uh, indigenous and local communities. It's really very much geared toward that response. It's true that it's an absolute aberration that we're looking at 3% of spending in prevention when in the end, prevention is infinitely less costly than cure. But part of it is also that we are lacking a common language across these different sectors. As you've said, I spent many years working in the conservation sector, trying to permeate the health sector only to realize, you know, many, and, and, and building those relationships of trust, only to realize that we're speaking very different languages in the end. And then you learn uh, that that communication is incredibly, is incredibly important. Uh, over time. So building that capacity, building that common understanding, I think is really at the root of understanding why prevention is infinitely um, more effective than, than cure. Starting from a common, st you know, a, a, a common uh, ground. Yeah. So let me come to us a follow-up question to that, which is, which brings us closer to where we are here today. Um, our organization has been very involved for two years in advocacy to try to promote a much more comprehensive approach to pandemic prevention and preparedness. When we began this work, and there are others working on this too, of course, uh, it was painful to see that almost all the attention is on containment and response. Yes which is extremely important and needs more attention and more resources. But as we all know personally, and from reading the news every day, only gets you so far. And in some settings, doesn't get you very far at all. And contributes enormously to inequities and so on, right? We're still looking at the majority of people in some low-income countries have not even had one dose of vaccine. We'll come to the equity issues a little bit later. So we've been advocating for much more attention to primary prevention yes. in our conversations with the WHO yes. and actors and member states around the WHO process and the negotiation of a hoped for new treaty on pandemic prevention yes. and preparedness. But it's been really hard. It's been really hard to get WHO process, not just the WHO itself, but the process around the WHO has convened on this new treaty to give space to this. We're making progress and, and, and we're happy to see that. It's been even harder to get this organization and process here in Montreal to oh, give yeah. attention to this. Yeah. There was language on this 
in the GBF, in the yeah. draft GBF, which we were happy with and working on and yeah, helping yeah. with, and it was taken out. In the middle of a pandemic, it right. was taken out. Right. What is going on here? Why is it so hard to work across these silos between these large UN institutions in the middle of a pandemic to get progress on, on joined up work across sectors on these issues? That that is the million dollar question, uh, <laughs> Nigel. Absolutely, because you know there's because there's actually a lack of coherence if you really think about it. If we go back into the CBD decisions, uh, into the CBD decision processes, One Health is not something new. It's something that certainly garnered a lot more attention since the COVID nineteen pandemic. All of a sudden, you see, oh well, the you know, interlinkages between biodiversity and health actually matter uh, is something that is relatively new in some of these spheres, but it's something that we had been talking about for many years within the context of the Convention on Biological Diversity. There was a whole entire joint work program that had been created uh, for that. There's decision uh, 1221. It's sad that I know the number of the decisions. There's also, for instance, Decision 14.4, please do look at these decisions in which biodiversity uh, a inclusive One Health guidance had been developed and adopted. And it's actually, and right now, now that this um, uh, conference of the parties has actually been delayed by two years precisely because of a pandemic, we are looking back, we are going back on some of that text where biodiversity inclusive guidance was already adopted four years ago and now we're trying to uh you know trying to to have a narrative around whether or not one health is important i mean it it just it seems it seems nonsensical in some ways but in others it's also evidence that we are we are lacking that mainstreaming component because we have a tendency to be talking within our echo chambers. So the people that are working and operating within the Convention on Biological Diversity, and I say this because I, I was within some of those echo chambers, so I can, you know, it can also be a self-reflection as well. But, and so we're saying now, well, it's really critically important to, uh, address the environmental drivers, the root causes of pandemics, really get to the heart of what those are, and some of them have been discussed by the minister this morning. But we're not bringing those very same drivers, that very same acknowledgement to the World Health Assembly. So it really is essential to have that dialogue um, across the different spheres of governance because the discussions that are happening, <clears throat> sorry, the discussions that are happening in the context of the pandemic uh, treaty negotiations are very different from those that we're having here now. Thank you, Christina. We'll come back to that. Um, when I get to you, Chadia, perhaps you might comment on some of this as well and others in the room. 